Hello and welcome back to A-Level Biology Help. Today I'm going to take you through the Energy and Ecosystems section for HUA A-Level Biology. Also, near the end of the video, I'll be going through a few exam questions and explaining their mark schemes. And as always, I'll be putting timestamps in the comments section so that you can skip to the different sections in the video if you do not wish to watch the whole thing. Right, so let's get started. So what do we mean by an ecosystem? By an ecosystem we mean a form of a biological community containing all living and non-living factors. Examples of an ecosystem can be a desert or maybe even a tropical rainforest. But for this video we're mainly focusing on the flow of energy through ecosystems, so mainly through food chains for example. So, all organisms, living organisms, require energy to live for various biological processes. Some organisms obtain their energy from the sun, so plants, for photosynthesis. And some, so, for example, primary consumers, secondary consumers, etc., obtain their energy from consuming other organisms. This energy is used, and carbon dioxide in the case of plants, to synthesise organic compounds. So in the case of plants, most sugars synthesised by them by photosynthesis are used as respiratory substrates. The rest of the sugars that aren't used as respiratory substrates are used to form other biological molecules such as lipids and proteins. These molecules form what we call the biomass of the plant. So biomass is what we are going to focus on now. So how is biomass measured? Well, biomass can be measured in terms of mass of carbon or dry mass of tissue per, per given area. Or it can be measured with by the chemical energy store in the dry biomass, which is measured through the process of calorimetry. So the next thing we are going to focus on is food, food chains and the flow of energy through them, which is the main bulk of the video. So, you're probably familiar with a basic food chain. A food chain consists of many different levels, or trophic levels, as we call them at A level. So first we have a producer, which is something like a plant or grass, as shown in the image here. Then we have a primary consumer, for example a mouse. Then we have a secondary consumer, for example, a snake. And then we have a tertiary consumer, which, for example, is a hawk. So energy is transferred through these trophic levels. So the primary consumer, so the mouse, obtains energy from the producer. The snake obtains energy from the mouse and the hawk obtains energy from the snake. Now, the most crucial thing to remember here is energy is lost throughout the food chain through processes such as respiration and excretion. So, energy loss can occur due to respiration and excretion of faeces and urine, for example. So, if the producer con contains 10 joules of energy, the prime consumer can sometimes obtain less energy as energy can be lost through the respiration of the producer. So for example, I've just written here that the primary consumer gets nine joules, and the secondary consumer might get even less, so six joules, and the tertiary consumer gets even less than that, so they can get one joule. As I said earlier, this is due to respiration and excretion of faeces and urine. The drop in energy or the energy loss is often larger between the consumers as these carry out excretion through faeces and urine, however producers do not carry out this process. What we can do with these energy losses is that we can calculate the efficiency of the energy transfer. So if we take, if I just get my pen tool, I can find my cursor. So if we take the energy loss between the primary consumer and the secondary consumer, so the primary consumer has 9 joules of energy and the secondary consumer has 6 joules of energy, we can find the efficiency. So this is basically a percentage. 
So we divide 6 by 9 and then we multiply by 100 to get percentage efficiency. So the percentage efficiency of energy transfer between the primary consumer and the secondary consumer is 66.6%, rounded to three significant figures. There are many ways in which we can measure energy losses. The first one is how we can measure energy losses through, well, producers, so plants. So we can measure it through what we call gross primary production, or GPP for short. The definition of gross primary production is the chemical energy store in plant biomass in a given area or volume. The key term here is plant. And then we can measure the net primary production, or MPP, which is the chemical energy store in plant biomass after respiratory losses to the environment have been taken into account. So gross primary production is all the energy store, and net primary production is the energy store after respiratory losses have been taken into account. So we can calculate net primary production using this formula. So net primary production equals gross primary production minus respiratory losses, denoted here by the letter R. So net primary production calculations are mainly used for plant growth and reproduction, as it doesn't take into account energy losses through excretion of faeces and urine. However, it is also available to other trophic levels, for example herbivores and decomposers, as they mainly obtain their energy through the producers themselves. So for the consumers higher up in the trophic levels, we can use net production. We calculate net production through this formula here, I minus F plus R. The brackets here indicate that you need to calculate the F plus R calculation before you take it away from I. I means the chemical energy store in ingested food. So this suggests that you need to use net production for consumers as cons consumers ingest food from organisms lower down in the trophic levels. F means the chemical energy loss to the environment in faeces and urine. The easiest way to remember that is F for faeces and for I, I for ingested food. And R, which is the same as net primary production, are respiratory losses to the environment, so R for respiratory. So the rate of primary and secondary production can be measured too. So we can call this primary or secondary productivity. This is measured as biomass in a given area in a given time, for example, kilojoules per hectare per year. This is a good tool to use to measure primary and secondary production as it often changes with seasons because obviously in the summer it's more hot so the organisms or the consumers are more likely to lose um, liquid through excretions of sweat and obviously they'll have a higher rate of respiration losses. And also we use a given area as well as the environmental conditions differ through different areas. Right, so that is it for the content, and now, now I am going to get on to some exam style questions. So let's just get my highlighter tool out. So the graph shows how gross productivity and biomass in an area change with time in the succession from bare soil to mature woodland. So the first thing we need to notice is that it's asking you about gross productivity. So this is the pr rate of prime gross primary production so all the chemical energy store in plants without respiratory losses so here we have this nice graph so on the x-axis we have time in years and the dotted curve here is gross productivity and the straight curve here is biomass so let's look at the first part of the question suggest appropriate units for gross productivity so we need to take into account energy, time and area. So you can just use the suggestion that I made a few minutes ago. So kilojoules per hectare per year. It doesn't really matter which units you use. 
you just it just needs to be appropriate to calculate. So let's look at the Mach scheme. If the Mach scheme says units of energy, so kilojoules, mass per area per year. So you can either put a unit of energy or mass, it doesn't really matter which one you put. So if it says unit of energy or mass, you can use any unit of energy or mass, so grams, milligrams, joules, megajoules or whatever. Then it says per area, so you can use any unit of area, so for metre squared or centimetre squared or per hectare. And then per year, because on the x-axis the time is measured in years. So if you measured it in months or days, you don't get the mark. But we got it right, so we'll get the mark. So let's look at the next part of the question. The next part of the question says, explain the decrease in gross productivity as the woodland matures. As this is an explained question, we need to justify our explanation for why there is a decrease in gross productivity. So this is what I've explained. There is more competition for light. I've written this because in the question it says there is succession from bare soil to mature woodland. Now you're going to touch on succession in the populations in the ecosystems chapter later on in the course. But as the wood the bare soil develops to mature woodland, as it says in the as it says in the question, there's obviously going to be competition for light as larger plants are grown being grown. So they are fighting to obtain energy from light. As there is more competition for light, the smaller or um, less adaptable plants can't photosynthesise efficiently as they are getting less light. So I put, so there is reduced photosynthesis. So let's look at the mark scheme. Less light slash more shading slash more competition for light. So we'll get that mark. You can put any one of these to get the mark. And it says neutral references to animals. Now, when it says neutral, it means that the examiner doesn't really want you to write that, as the question is basically referring to plants. As the question says, the woodland is developing from bare soil to mature woodland. So it doesn't really mention animals in the question. And the second marking point says reduced photosynthesis or less photosynthesis. Also, it, it, it accepts no photosynthesis. However, there must be some level of photosynthesis as the woodland is developing, but they do accept no photosynthesis. So we would get both marks for that question. So let's move on. So the next part of the question says, use the information in the graph and your knowledge of net productivity to explain why biomass shows little increase after 100 years. So as we can see, at 100 years, the gross productivity or, and the biomass doesn't increase very much. In fact, the gross productivity kind of levels off, or as you can see, it decreases slightly, actually. So as the question says, you're use your knowledge of net productivity, you need to explain what net productivity is. And also it says use information from the graph. So you need to take data from the graph and use it in your answer. And as it says explain, you don't need to put what is happening, you need to justify why something is happening. So this is what I've put. Net productivity is gross productivity minus respiratory losses. So this takes into account knowledge of net productivity, as the question says. So I've written, so the biomass shows little increase after 100 years. So as you can see here, it doesn't really increase that much after 100 years. And I've put that it's due to an increase in respiration. So there's more respiratory losses. Right, so let's look at the mark scheme. So the first marking point says net productivity is gross productivity minus respiratory loss. So we will get that mark. And please remember that it is essential that you explain what net productivity is, as again the question says using your knowledge of net productivity. When a question says use your knowledge, it often requires you to write some kind of a definition. Also, the second marking point says there is a decrease in gross productivity or photosynthesis or an increase in respiration 
We wrote increase in respiration, so we would get both marks for this question. But you can write any one of these to get the second marking point. Right, this is the last question that we're going to cover in this video, which is kind of not really related to the syllabus. But it says, suggest one reason for conserving woodlands. Again, as this is a suggest question, it requires your own ideas and your own knowledge. So there are many, many reasons for conserving woodlands. For example, protecting the environment from global warming and protecting endangered species, conserving habitats. But the question highlights that you can only suggest one reason. So the reason that I've wrote is to protect endangered species, but there are many reasons. So let's look at the mark scheme. You can put any five of these points. So the first one that you can put is that it conserves or protects habitats or niches. The second marking point that you can write is conserving or protecting endangered species or maintains or increases biodiversity. We wrote protecting endangered species, so we would get the mark for this question. Or you can write it reduces global warming or greenhouse effect, climate change or remove or take up carbon dioxide. You can write source of medicines or chemicals or wood. Or you can write reduces erosion or eutrophication. And also it says here except tourism slash aesthetics slash named recreational activity. So you can refer to this but the examiner prefer prefers it if you write one of these. Now as the question says one max this means that if you put more than one of these points, you don't get more than one mark. You can only get a maximum of one mark for this question. Right, that is all I want to say for this video. Thank you very, very much for watching. If you have any questions at all, please leave them in the comment section. I'll be more than happy to answer them and I'll see you in the next video.